So what I'm going to ask our panelists to do is um, to please introduce yourself, however you feel most comfortable, and then share with us a pivotal experience or person from your education that helped create you. And like mine is Gloria Jones, who taught me US history in 11th grade. She was a strong, powerful woman. She was not afraid to talk about being a feminist, which I loved. And we were just chatting about this early on. Um, just a great role model for me, and also taught me to love the social sciences. Anyway, um, so we'll just start here and kind of work our way down the line, and you can introduce yourselves, please. Okay. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Better? OK. So my name is Lydia Moretti. I'm a social and behavioral scientist um, focusing on reproductive health. I have worked for more than a decade as a program implementer and also as a researcher in global health. Um, currently, I'm a, I'm a director, direct one of our projects at Pathfinder International, known as the Beyond Bias Project, which focuses on uh, access to, uh, to contraceptives for adolescents and youth um, around the globe. So pivotal individuals in my life, and in terms of my education, I like to credit that to my parents who've never gone to school. I was born and raised in Kenya, uh, in a semi-nomadic community. Um, most of my extended family didn't go to school, and education was not much valued. But my parents saw it important for myself and my siblings. We are six of us, three boys, three girls, to go to school. Uh, and so they're really important to me. The other piece that I'd like to add that actually was helpful in making sure that I got as far as I got is my brother who coming from, again, a very um, poor background, managed to get a scholarship to study abroad in the United States, got a free ride to MIT, and then managed to support the rest, all the rest of us, the six of us, through school, where my dad was not able to do. So thank you. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Christina Lowry, um, and I lead the organization Girl Rising. Um, Girl Rising is an organization that is working to change the way the world values girls and girls' education. My background, um, um, I have long, ever since I graduated from college, ping-ponged between my love of storytelling, which first started out in theater uh, and then found its way to documentary film, and international development. Um, and I've produced many documentary films, and then about 10 years ago, I was helping to run a documentary film production company in New York, and we were approached by a funder um, to create a project, some sort of film project, on how to end global poverty, that really small subject. <laughs> um, and it was the research for that project that led us to the mountain of evidence about educating girls, which I'm sure we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but um, we, I came to this uh, field, uh, to this topic of educating girls, um, as a documentary filmmaker with a group of journalists. Um, and so it was not a kind of rights-based argument that we were putting forth in the film that we ended up making. It was that there is this mountain of evidence about what happens when you educate girls. Um, so hard to pick just one person from, um, from my past that was uh, really instrumental for me. So I'm going to just say two. One, my grandmother. Uh, my grandmother used to tell me stories about uh, how she crossed Texas in a covered wagon as a young woman. Um, and then was a teacher in a one-room schoolhouse and would ride her horse uh, from her family's um, uh, town to where she taught school, board with a family, teach in a one-room schoolhouse, and, um, and return home on the weekends. And she not only imparted the importance of education, but uh, I think one of the most important life lessons that she gave me was, um, you know, n nobody ever said it was supposed to be easy that work and family and juggling it all is, uh, is not easy. And that's just part of what life is, and you have to kind of dig down. Um, the second person was my fourth grade teacher, um, Dorothy Searing, 
who uh, had, I went to an all girl school at that time, and she, uh, she did things with us that uh, when I think now, uh, how, how ambitious they were, and we just thought that they were normal. We did a Shakespeare play, we put on Macbeth, uh, she cast me as Macbeth uh, in the fourth grade. And so I really saw what happens when you can hold young people to high expectations um, and, and let them dig into things that may even seem to be, um, you think might be older than, older than their ages. So she was the most inspiring teacher I have. I think about her all the time and really instilled a love of learning, a lifelong learning. So thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Anissa Salat. I am Somali, born in Mogadishu, um, raised in Somalia, Kenya, Saudi Arabia, very nomadic. <laughs> um, but uh, traditionally, when we were nomadic by choice, uh, but uh, uh, lately it, it's not by choice, it's because of the civil war that we have had to move around and live in other parts of the world. Um, um, so I'll tell you what I'm doing here now and then skip back to the moment that got me here, the educational moment. Um, um, now I came here to, to do my bachelor's degree. Um, I went to school in Bryn Mawr College in uh, Philadelphia area um, and um, graduated in 2016. I now work with a phenomenal foundation, One Earth Future Foundation based in uh, Broomfield uh, that does peace work, um, and I specifically work with the Shirako program, which does impact, impact investing in Somalia. So very close to home. Um, how I got here. Uh, one uh, life-changing moment for me was when Global Education Fund nonprofit came to my school, my high school in Kenya, to recruit me into the program and pay for my school fees. Global Education Fund is actually a Boulder-based nonprofit, a small world. <laughs> and I live here in this area, Broomfield, and work here now. Um, Global Education Fund came to our high school looking for bright girls to uh, help uh, with Springboard um, and take them to the next level. Um, I was fortunately one of those. Um, I got m I, my school fees was paid, and but the most f important part was beyond school fees. It was the mentorship and the leadership support that I got through the program, um, which was just uplifting for me as a first generation student. My parents cared a lot about school, hence why they sent me to school, which is great. But they didn't go to school themselves, didn't really know how to support me through the process, couldn't tell me what would happen next, what to look forward to, couldn't give me the context I needed. Global Education Fund did that for me, and it was life-changing. Um, from telling me what types of programs to look for in terms of um, um, college applications, so they connected me to Zawadi Africa, which is a phenomenal program in East Africa, um, <coughs> help support uh, girls apply to US and Canadian-based universities, um, and basically describe to you the application process, which you can understand it's not easy to get into US schools, so doing it from all the way Kenya, you need that extra support. Um, but Global Education didn't just hand me over to Zawadi and said, we wash, your, we wash our hands, now you're, you're good to go. Uh, they have been there for me um, in terms of um, providing stationary computer, inviting me to the office, come do your applications here anytime, printing anything you need. It's small things like that that make a huge impact in somebody's um, life, just getting that mentorship um, role models to look up to, knowing what to do next. So I would say definitely it was when Global Education Fund came to my uh, life and educational journey. And Global Education Fund is actually now a partner with Girl Rising. It's a beautiful partnership doing amazing things and they continue to do amazing things. Well, gee, I don't have a story to top that, so. <laughs> 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 um, 
Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Susie Snyder. Uh, I work on nuclear weapons issues. Um, and I'm currently a managing director of a project called Don't Bank on the Bomb, where we challenge the financial um, investments in the companies that produce nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. It's a cooperative project between the organization that funds me day to day called PAX, which is a Dutch organization, and ICANN, the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. And we won a Nobel Peace Prize a couple of years ago, which is kind of a neat thing. Um, and uh, it's kind of a neat thing. And uh, so I want to point to uh, a few people who have inspired, um, inspired me and helped me get those, those life-changing moments um, and helped, really helped me get to where I am now. And one of them is this woman uh, who runs a, an organization out of Oakland, California called Western States Legal Foundation. So she had invited me to come to Washington, D.C. to talk to congressional people about nuclear issues because I was interested in it because I was. Um, and we had this meeting in this congressional office. And in the meeting, I was quite young. I was in my early 20s. Um, and in the meeting, the, the, the congressional staffer turned to me and said, well, do you have a PhD in hydrology? And I said, no. And he said, well, then why should I listen to you? Yeah, so I said, well, because I live in the community that I'm talking about. And then I stopped talking. And the rest of the meeting, I, did, I didn't say anything. Because I, I didn't know how to, how to deal with it, right? Um, and so this woman, Jackie, she pulled me aside after, she was also in the meeting. She pulled me aside afterwards, and she said, you know what? You, you have read the three feet of books on environmental impact statement. You know what you're talking about. Don't ever let somebody question your credentials and shut you down again. She was amazing. And because of that, I very rarely shut up. And so <laughs> I apologize in advance to my fellow panelists. Um, and I want to go, and I am I'm, I'm fiercely passionate. I love what I do to the point of self detriment. And it is, it's very hard. And especially as a woman, I feel like I have something to prove. I spend double the time doing the research. I am overly prepared, uh, I talk too much, I love it. Um, and then I had this boss who was Swedish, a woman by the name of Sherstin Greyback. And Sherstin uh, is Swedish, and the Swedes have a very different perspective on work and work-life balance than somebody who grew up in New York, <laughs> let me tell you. <laughs> um, and I was living in Switzerland at the time, and I was the head of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, which is the world's oldest women's peace organization, and phenomenal, and here in Colorado, and find them, because women's organizations matter. Sherston said, you have to take a holiday. And I said, but I took like, I took like three days over Christmas. I'm great. She said, no, no, no. <laughs> Honey, that's not what a holiday is. You need to take a minimum of three weeks. And actually, you should take six. Because you are not giving your ch yourself a chance to think deeply about the issues that matter. You are denying us the benefit of your strategic insight by overworking yourself. You are hurting us as an organization by not taking care of yourself. <clears throat> I am now a fierce advocate. I sit on the human right, uh, the uh, human rights, the human resources. <laughs> See, the two are the same. The human resources committee of every board that I'm I'm involved in, because people being able to do the work that they are passionate about makes a difference and making sure that people are supported to take care of themselves makes a difference. She revolutionized my life, and now I take holidays. I'm not great at it, but I, I do that. And the very last, last person I want to give credit to is somebody who helped me to remember to tell people to take credit for what I do. And that's a hard thing to do. And it's something that we look to our friends. We look to our, our sisters, our allies in this work to kind of lift us up when we forget. So, so my last shout out is to Teresa Younger. Thanks. Thanks. All right, so um, one of the things I wanted to ask is, uh, so the, the topic, as I mentioned, is education results in healthy, empowered girls who impact their communities and future generations. And my first question relating to that is how? Um, and I'll let you guys just go, and whoever would like to speak to that first is welcome to. 
Well, I'm happy to, to start, and we can just ping pong down and say a whole bunch of incredible statistics, because that's what's out there, a mountain of evidence of what happens when you educate girls. Um, I'll just say a, a few things. Um, you know, educated girls uh, turn in, are able to grow up to be women uh, who have proven to have fewer and healthier children. Uh, one extra year of education uh, for a girl means being able to earn 20% more uh, as an adult. Girls who complete secondary school are six times as as are are six times um, less likely to be child brides, and uh, when girls are married early and have children early, there is a, a cycle of both health um, detrimental health effects for them and for their children, and cycles of poverty that are uh, difficult to stop unless their children are able to be educated. Um, educated girls are less likely to contract diseases. The statistics about AIDS um, and contracting AIDS as girls are educated is astounding. Um, and the thing to us at Girl Rising that was so amazing is all of these statistics about health, about income, about ability to stand up for one's rights, um, uh, and about being more than twice as likely to educate sons and daughters equally means that educating girls begins a positive ripple effect that goes across generations and affects some of the most vexing problems that across development people are working on, from health to poverty to water to agriculture to climate change to resilience to disaster. So um, there is, I really encourage people to become educated about this issue. One of the um, most useful resources I have that I refer to all the time is a book written by Rebecca Winthrop um, called What Works in Girls' Education. And in it, she really lays out what this mountain of evidence is um, and shows that educating girls is one of the best investments that can be made um, to address all of these different issues. And just to add up to what uh, Christina has said, I want to speak about the connection between the work that we do in reproductive health uh, by looking at the, uh, the connection between reproductive empowerment and economic empowerment. And so we have discovered through research and obviously experience that uh, reproductive empowerment, which is, again, goes back to a woman's ability to make decisions about her reproduction, meaning when to get married, who to get married to, when to have children, how many children to have, and whether to use contraception, all those decisions, the empowerment is impossible to, uh, to have if you don't have economic empowerment. And so there's such a strong link uh, in the area of reproduction or reproductive health and rights with a woman's education. Um, I also want to speak about uh, labor participation. Obviously, when a woman or a girl has gone to school, then she's likely to have a better career and make more money. Um, and what we find in, in especially in developing world, which is, which is where the bulk of our work is, is that the only uh, choices for a woman or for a girl is either school or marriage, like Christine has spoken, uh, has said. And so when a girl is not in school, she ends up being a child bride. And by her being a child bride, it means that then the, uh, her, the chores that she is, uh, or she's predisposed to, or she ends up doing, is mostly nurturing and you know, uh, household chores that normally are not enumerated. You, know? uh, they, you don't get any income from it, even if it's an important chore, but you don't get any income from it. And so then what happens is women then become very dependent on their husbands for livelihood, and then when it comes to decisions about their own bodies, the number of children they want, um, or even to use contraception, you find that they defer that decision to the man because he's the breadwinner. And you find women even staying in abuse or abusive relationships because they are afraid to leave the breadwinner or because they know that the man, if he's not happy, is going to abandon her and her children. And so then they find, you find themselves settling in. So there is this big connection in terms of how we want uh, to make sure that women thrive in their own lives and be able to make their own uh, reproductive decisions. Um, and then the, co the connection to education is obvious. But I, one more thing I wanted to say, 
that I'm very passionate about. And I know on this table we'll be talking about it a lot, which is the You Educate a Girl, You Educate a Village, and which is wonderful and it's great and it's true that when you send a woman to school, then there's all these report effects and, and uh, you know, on, on in her village and in our community, which is wonderful. But I think sometimes we're swinging the pendulum very far off where when we think about a woman's education, we feel a very strong need to qualify. You know, she will then change our entire village. And we don't have the same, I don't think we have the same expectation on the boy child. Remember where we are starting, really. We are not starting from a place where, or we are saying, leave the boy at home and send the girl to school so then these are the benefits you get. No, the status quo, let's all remember, is that the boy child is going to school and the girl is being left at home and all we are advocating for, let's send all kids to school because it's the right thing to do. It is the right thing to do. It is true when 50% of your population is left without education, then the, you know, obviously from an economic standpoint and all the points that Christina has made, uh, we will suffer as, as, as a society and as a global world. But then at the same time, I think let's not overburden the child, the girl child. <laughs> I think she has a right to go to school to thrive for herself. And that should be enough to begin with. That should be enough. If I can, I, I really want to pick up on that because that, that, throws, <laughs> that throws the whole question um, at us. Who's responsible for development? Who's responsible for lifting society? And when we say that our number one priority is education of girls, I, I agree, education of girls is absolutely imperative. Um, so is education of boys. Um, and if we say that we are gonna solve the problems of the world, the, the problems of development by educating more girls, we are putting the burden of, of saving society on those girls. Mm -hmm. And what a nasty thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, I mean, I, like, we have, we have some, I mean, we are all share, we share equally mm -hmm. um, in the world. And if we want to see equity, if we want, we have to also share the burden of, of development equally. So I, I really support and I'm so grateful for programs that, that do put this focus on educating girls because that is necessary to get us to that equity. But let's manage our expectations mm -hmm. just a bit more and also pay attention to when we're educating girls, are we also educating boys to share in the responsibilities of the household so that those girls can go to school, so that girls can be part of society, so they can play sports. Are we, are we you know, are we, making sure that we're, we're doing these things in a balanced way. And that's, that's a hard, it's a hard question. I don't have easy answers, but I love asking hard questions. I just want to jump in really quickly and say I couldn't agree more. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that we do at Girl Rising when we're working um, in programs with adolescent uh, boys and girls is, is really talk about what are, help them begin to explore what are the gender norms that are around them? What is taken as normal? Or as somebody yesterday said to me, what's taken as just the wallpaper, right? What, is it normal that a girl needs to go home, if she is in school, goes to, needs to go home and do the chores while her brother gets to go play? Or is that discrimination? Is it normal that a boy would get to eat first at the dinner table before the girl, or is that discrimination? And one of the things I've been so moved by is how boys come up with really interesting ways to address these issues, whether or not they you know, take a pledge to share in the housework at home with their sisters, but recognizing the norms that are holding girls back and engaging boys in these very things. You're right, it is a heavy burden to have to save the world. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I, I would love to speak to everything you all said. It, um, I'm a living example of everything they said. <laughs> everything, including the expectations. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for pointing that out. Um, so I'll start with the positives. Um, Christina shared amazing statistics about the choices that girls make after they get education, um, how, they're so, how they can support their families and their immediate, um, um, basically, yes, immediate family. I love that you emphasized on that, that she is able to educate her children even, or, and support her children, because that's the key thing I've seen um, 
right now. Um, I don't have children, that was misleading. What I have seen, it's going to get a little bit personal, <laughs> but um, I'm happily married for two and a half years now, and in my journey, I was able to decide how to plan my family. Mm -hmm. um, it's a conversation I had with my husband before I got married, even. I said, you know, I want to work after um, graduation. Um, I want to get some years of experience. And these are my goals in life. And I would like to plan us to fa plan our family accordingly. He said, yes, I understand, I agree. Um, I'm privileged to be married to someone I knew from a young age, all the way uh, from the same village in Somalia and then lived in Nairobi, Kenya. That helps with the understanding because he knows how much I have been through and what I did to get here. Uh, so he's, he said, absolutely, yes, we will do it that way. Um, if I may add, I'm the first person in my family to really be educated about family planning options and utilize those options. First one, in my family, extended family, even friends, neighbors at home, everybody. And it's, it's a difficult topic to even talk about, but I don't hide that fact about my life. Um, I explain to my friends and family, say I made this choice because of A, B, C, D. Not everyone understands it, but I, it, it still share that and share the benefits. And I think culturally, people eventually get there with more, more education, more examples, more reasons. Um, I'm able to support myself. Um, I have a great paying job. And um, uh, that's very useful and impactful. I can contribute to my family and my uh, community that way. Um, now let's start with the family. <laughs> Family, in terms of supporting financially, sending my sisters to schools, mentoring them through that, I am the key person who does that in my family. They live in Kenya. I speak with them. This morning I was talking to them, video conferences. Thank, thank God to <laughs> internet. <laughs> you can get to do all of that. But I'm able to do all of this, again, because simply because of being able to finish secondary school. That's where it starts. Ability to finish high school, get that degree, then doors open. You have guidance, mentorship, amazing people in my life that I have had throughout. Then one step leads to another. There's huge expectation that comes with that, as you have touched on that. Um, and even before I came to the panel today, I said, Am I supposed to talk about an amazing program I started and you know, traveled around the world to solve some problem? I honestly had a concern about that. I said, I, I'm supposed to talk about that, but I don't have that. <laughs> There's a reason why I don't have that program yet. <laughs> it's a huge expectation. It's a huge bar to meet. It's enough what <laughs> I'm doing. And thank you so much yeah. for, <laughs> for <laughs> Can I just say, I just wanted to say one more thing. Um, one of the um, activities that we do with um, young people in classrooms a lot is we do a, what's called a, a life cycle, a life cycle circle. And we have students think about the life cycle um, of a girl growing into a woman with education and without being able to graduate from high school. And there is a lot of focus on what happens when girls are educated as, as young women, as, as mothers. But one of the things that's been the most <coughs> profound and um, to me is in thinking about what happens in later life? What is the 50 to 75 year old or 65 to 75 year old age uh, look like? What does life look like if you haven't had an education? And interestingly, the very first person I met on Monday night at CWA um, was this, a neurologist uh, from Harvard Medical School who said the data around women's mental health, uh, women globally, and I may get these statistics wrong, so forgive me, um, are two-thirds two -thirds more likely to contract to have Alzheimer's, to suffer from Alzheimer's. One of the leading causes of that is lack of education globally. 
So girls' education is something that affects people, health, you know, personally, mental health, physical health, um, economic well-being, yes, for their family and everybody around them, but for them, for their entire life. So that, to me, was something that was very profound from earlier this week. Thanks. Um, just to let you all know, we, I have um, received several really good questions, so we're probably not going to be able to get to all of them, but we'll start in on them because you guys have asked some awesome questions so far. The first one, I'm really glad somebody asked this because this has been top of my mind. Um, this question is from a student. My question is, how do you think we, can, we incorporate trans, non-binary, and other queer folks into our discussions about women, fem feminism, and education when so much of the rhetoric around these topics just affirm the gender binary? Oh, that's a great question. I, I love that question. Thank you. Whoever asked that, thank you very much. Um, and this is a conversation that I think it's so important for us to have. And um, going back to my, my excellent friend, Teresa, uh, who talks about this as a conversation and as looking at the ways that we, um, we use certain words. So when we talk about um, feminism, we, we have to be intentional in our language. We have to talk about what it is that we actually mean. Do we mean the social, um, the social economic, and justice equality for all genders? Um, and then maybe we should just start with that <clears throat> instead of starting with the word feminism, which immediately puts in and reinforces a binary. Um, maybe we should start with kind of the looking at how we can be as inclusive and open and not, not put limits. And, and using our words is really necessary in this. And it's something that I think we are all struggling with on a daily basis. What is the best way we can talk about, about these issues? And I'm, I'm so glad this got brought up because I've seen these conversations starting to take place in an international sphere uh, for the first time. A lot of my work is around the UN, uh, and it is it's an institution that was created in the 1940s um, and has evolved somewhat, uh, somewhat, but let's also take a minute and remember it took until the year 2000 for it to recognize that there is a disproportionate impact of conflict on women and girls. It hasn't quite gotten to the point of recognizing um, the disproportionate impact on those who do not identify as man or woman or those who are trans or, or, or non-binary. Um, but it is getting there. There are conversations that have started. Why? Because people asked the question. So I just want to end this with whoever asked that question, please never stop asking that question. Um, okay, here's another student question. How do you think teaching and classroom dynamics need to change to empower female students in school? Uh, that's a really interesting question. Um, there has been a lot of research on um, what's called gender responsive pedagogy. Um, and, um, and in the international uh, development field in international education, girls' education, um, even just very recently, uh, lots of new sort of guides and how-tos for teachers uh, to think about uh, from early childhood all the way through how to think about their classroom um, practices differently. Um, one of the things that we did about three, four years ago, I was in Rajasthan, India, and we had uh, done a program with local teachers, and many of them were male. Um, and uh, this teacher stood up and said, you know, until, un until I went through this program, I, I had no idea that I was part of the problem. I had no idea that the things that I just took as normal, having the girls wash the lunch dishes after, after lunch and the boys doing something else, or calling on the people that were raising their hand who were more often boys who would shoot their hand up than girls, that I was reinforcing uh, norms in that classroom and that I was not being supportive of girls. Um, uh, so I, I'm not an expert on what all of those things are, but there has been a lot of research um, over the last few years about what are very practical tools for teachers and practical ways of teaching? Um, sometimes it is um, instead of instead of um, having people shoot their hands up, being able to create a structure where people write 
write, write their questions down on cards. Um, and that being shown to, uh, to that, that, that both boys and girls are given sort of equal opportunity to have their questions put forth. Um, uh, and so I think, you know, one of the things as we move forward in this space is really thinking about what are, what is the training that teachers need in many, many places to the curricula, the national curricula standards, the examples in those curricula are not showing role models of female scientists or women in, in other positions. And so it's also looking at the curriculum itself um, and, and how it's being taught and those classroom practices. Can I just throw one tiny thing in there? I had a second grade teacher, Mrs. Astorita. She did this really funny thing um, that made us terrified, but got away, got away from this, um, from rewarding those of us who did like to sit in the front and raise their hand all the time. <clears throat> uh, and <laughs> what she did is she put everybody in the class's name in a, in a bowl, and she just picked them out. And she wouldn't call on somebody a second time until everyone in the class had been called on. If you weren't getting called on in the first three or four, you just you saw that the, the bowl go just lower, 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 just really, really nervous. But it changed the way that we engaged, and it it so it got over shyness, um, and it also eliminated the question of of who's going to get it because of whatever reason. Very simple, tiny little thing, and I don't know where Mrs. Estrada got this idea, um, but. It, it changed how I think about doing things in, in bigger groups a lot of times. Uh, and so building on, on these very, it's always good to have some really, really, really practical and simple. And that's something anybody can do anywhere. One other thing I'll say, um, it, I, I read a study last year that said that, um, that showed that teachers who practice these now recognized principles of gender responsive pedagogy, um, that uh, it's proven that both boys and girls do better. Um, so some of it is just um, different uh, teaching. In many places, there's still very much a top-down uh, kind of teacher delivering information to students um, in, in many places. And some of the gender responsive pedagogy is about classroom discussion and a whole different way of engaging students. And it is not that all of a sudden teachers are trying to kind of hold boys back and let girls have a chance, but it's different kind of teaching that in the end has proven to have better academic outcomes for both boys and girls. And if I can just add up uh, one small thing, just giving an example of my niece, my 10 year old niece uh, back in Kenya. So again, I, and I want to point this to the stigma around the, the, you know, the woman's body. And let's say menstrual hygiene, for instance, the fact that you, you don't get to control when you get your menses as a woman. And so my 10 year old niece, uh, for some reason, started her menses. Um, at an age of 10, she was the first in class to start her menses. And now remember this kid is, is in all activities. She's a swimmer, she runs truck, she does all these things. And she was crying because she was embarrassed. She was embarrassed that she didn't know what to say to the teacher why she wouldn't go swimming. She didn't know what to say that I can't do track today. And so just having a teacher, because we reached out to a teacher, her class teacher, who, who happened to be a woman, uh, to just help her navigate that, you know, navigate that and just need to call the games, you know, teacher and say, Lydia will not be swimming today. Her name is Lydia too. Lydia will not be swimming today. She'll not be doing, you know, track today. And I just looked at that and, and imagined it's because both her mother and the aunties were so empowered to fight for her and to push that forward. But then I wondered what about the girl in the village, you know, who might not have that kind of support. And so as teachers and as human beings, just recognizing these differences, biological differences, and our biological systems, and, and helping our girls walk through that with no shame would also make a big difference. Here's another question we got from a student. Um, What's the biggest obstacle faced in your journey to accomplishing this goal of girl education? Basically, what could we be doing better? And I would like to add both in the United States and then abroad, because I think there are probably different issues depending on where girls are. So take it away. Funding. <laughs> they say follow the money if you want to <laughs> know what the issue is. So where are we investing in? and um, where are our resources going in, really, that's the key. Um, being mindful of um, supporting that, both personally 
contributing to those courses, but also looking at organizations that are mindful of that and how that's practiced basically on a systematic level. Um, I agree with that, and I'll also say something that we talked about a little bit before, which is um, educating boys, which is really making sure that this doesn't become a girls and women's issue, um, that this is, a, this, is, this is just about equal access to education and equal quality learning opportunities and equal support. It shouldn't be something special. It's really just what, need, what, what should happen. But I think sometimes in the conversation and the way we talk about it, it can be um, alienating to boys and it, we need to have a generation of boys who are invested also in gender equality because these kind of discriminatory practices harm everybody. Um, not just not just girls and women. <clears throat> I would say one of the things that I, I see happening is there's this there's always a um, a push for more data, more data. We have to make data driven decisions, um, and I think that that is necessary. We need good good research, good data to to be able to shape policy. Um, but I think we also really need to remember that. Not all statistics represent all stories. And there, there might be, we might be missing some things um, in looking at this broader, um, broader way to, to increase access to education, to increase education um, across, across, the, across the board. That goes back to that question earlier about the non-binary, um, about trans folks. Like that's, that's something that's not always included in the data sets, right? And that's, I think it's important to, to recognize that. Not all statistics represent all stories. Um, and then the last thing is to, um, it was brought up earlier, uh, this like products that women need in order to function through life are often taxed as luxury goods. Why are women paying more money, like paying a luxury tax on tampons? You've got to be kidding me. <laughs> all right, I'm sorry. <laughs> but seriously, like this is absolutely ridiculous. Um, and that goes back to the question around economics um, and where is the money going? And why are, why are women in particular denied uh, certain access to things just because they're women? That's dumb AF. <laughs> I want to pipe in and say one thing that's related to what Anissa first said, which, which is funding. Um, but adding on to that, I think, um, you know, around the world, there are incredible people who have amazing ideas, who are living in communities, starting young organizations, um, and, and, and who know their community best. And it is both more funding, but it is funding um, n not just to massive institutions, but really thinking about how do we seed and support local visionary educational leaders who are going to be in those communities for a long time, uh, who may or may not scale and become the next big uh, thing that can take off like, um, like a rocket, but may just be a stable organization, educational organization that is going to affect the lives of thousands of children because they're in those communities. One of the things that, we, that Girl Rising is doing right now with Global Education Fund is really thinking about that and we're working on a, a project, a four-year project to support local educational entrepreneurs in India and Kenya that have really good ideas and are at a level in which they're kind of being left out of the game. They're not being supported because a lot of this funding, and thankfully there is more funding around social impact investing and around um, organizations that are um, that are growing and uh, with innovators at the helm, but often those are now bigger pots of money. But there are young organizations for whom a smaller amount, twenty or thirty thousand dollars over the course of time, uh, can really make a tremendous difference. And so I think the networks. This is happening, but networks of support for local visionary individuals who are beginning things on the ground in many places and have great ideas is another thing that's missing and I think that all of us can help support. And one final thing just from a reproductive health lens, 
Uh, when we talk about the challenges like of teenage pregnancies and we're looking at developing countries, the brunt of teenage pregnancies falls on the, on the go again. And just working with governments and ministries of health to make sure uh, that we have retention of girls in school, even when teenage pregnancies happen, to make sure that the girl has another way to come back to school. You'll, not, you'll be surprised maybe because it's not an issue in the United States, but for most uh, countries, if a girl gets pregnant while in school, she's expelled. You're expelled for school, from school because you're pregnant. Because it means you, how dare you, you had sex. And remember, a woman or a girl does not have sex alone to get pregnant. That's just that's a fact. Right? <laughs> but the girl just ends up being the one expelled out of school, and then the, she has no entry point again. And then again, that goes back to the cycle of poverty that we are talking about. So working to make sure that there are policies in place to make sure we have retention, our school retention for girls and completion rate uh, for girls. Just quickly to add something that's um, attainable would be just the interaction aspect that anybody can do, reaching out. Um, if you visit uh, those, these places, you know, going into the community, talking to the people, um, asking what the problem is, how they, it can be solved. And just uh, even just that exposure of uh, showing, uh, just talking to a girl child in, 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 in those places. And... Um, speaking about aspirations, educational goals, um, sharing your journey, educational journey, that alone is a huge inspiration and something that any one of us can do if you can travel to these places. But there's also internet and creative ways to go around these things. So if, as much contact, conversation, and exposure as possible, I would add. I'm gonna throw one more tiny thing because I, I think um, also, I'm very much looking, always looking at how you can do things very locally, right? So if you are in, if you are a boy in high school, can you get your friends to raise money to make um, menstrual products, tampons and pads available for girls? If you are a girl in high school, can you get money together and raise money to make sure that all boys can get condoms? Because there's not a single pregnancy that occurs without a man ejaculating, I mean, come on, <laughs> right? It just doesn't happen. Um, and sometimes, and maybe break the gender gap a little bit because then, yeah. then we're helping each other and we're lifting each other up as well. And we're helping each other be responsible um, in this. I didn't expect to say that word. <laughs> um, I have two questions from the audience that are, that are similar. Um, the, the first one is the compulsory education system has many, many weaknesses. It's very good at stamping out curiosity and our sense of agency. What should education mean? And kind of related to that is this other question. Can you all talk about non-cognitive factors as they intersect with education? Where do qualities like grit, resilience, help seeking, help seeking behavior, self-efficacy, et cetera, impact the reach and success of education? and how can we be teaching those qualities as well? I'll jump on the self-efficacy one uh, because it touches a lot again. I'm bringing the reproductive health lens here. Um, a, lot of, a lot of what we do in terms of reproductive health, what we start with with young children as they're growing up in schools and teaching sex education is body literacy. Just teaching how your body works reproductively. Uh, you'll be so surprised how many girls uh, back in the villages and in developing countries think when you have sex and you stand up and you jump or you have hot, you know, black tea, then you won't get pregnant uh, because that's all they hear. Or you take strong tea or you take lemon or you shower with lemon. So starting with body literacy, because what body literacy then does, it creates, it makes a woman or rouses a woman's self-efficacy to be able then to advocate for herself. If I know if I have sex, I'll get pregnant for sure, then I will need to talk about protection with, with, with my partner. You know, it, it starts there. The other component is that of uh, critical consciousness. Critical consciousness is the, um, the ability of an individual to recognize inequitable an an systems around them and then be able to do something about it to change it. So. Making girls understand again that education is a right, is a right that they have and not a favor, you know? And so that will push, like, in, like I've said in other panels, 
if we created this level of critical consciousness and have girls demanding this from their societies, from their communities, and, and, and then from their governments, then that is what will create a movement that then goes further into education. So critical consciousness and efficacy from that lens. Yeah, I'll just also say, you know, there is a there is a gr growing body of evidence that shows that it is not just learning, reading, writing, and arithmetic that's going to make you, you know, successful, and that that is the um, goal of education. These other things: grit, resilience, self-efficacy, agency, curiosity, empathy. Um, these are things that people are now really thinking hard about. How do I how do we teach this, um, both here and um, around the world? Um, and so to answer the question, I think absolutely those are critical pieces of being um, an educated and prepared human being. Um, uh, I have a dear friend who is the, um, is the head of uh, human resources for a massive 1,500 person company. She helped grow it from, uh, she was the first employee. And as an HR professional, she says, you know, the, the qualities that I'm looking for, that my team is looking for when we hire people, yes, we assume and of course we need people who are conversant in the basics, but we really need people who know how to work in teams. We need people who are curious. We need people who are lifelong learners. So. I I think that there's this whole other movement in education to think about it's we're not just we, we shouldn't just be looking at what's the edu educational system we need from K through 12 but what is the educational system we need and how do we educate those young people to be lifelong learners and then what's the structure that we need so that people can return and can actually um, get the skills and new things that they need as they as they go along um, so uh, yes, those things are absolutely critical. Um, absolutely, I agree um, that we have systemic challenges with education, both here in the US and abroad. Um, this question reminded me specifically one failure in my high school where um, the literature books that I was supposed to read and analyze, there were other books that analyzed those literature books that we were supposed to read and cram, and then just basically produce that. That was common practice. The teachers did not encourage, discourage it. It was sold everywhere. An analysis of the literature books, so b other books that you just can go get, read, memorize, and and just re and that's detrimental to critical yeah. thinking, mm -hmm. ability to just form your own ideas, your opinions about matters, and that's a huge educational failure. So definitely there are challenges out there. It's not just about uh, the arithmetics and mm -hmm. you know how many vocabulary do you know. There's much more that goes to education that we can support. For me, again, I, I cannot overemphasize how much educa Global Education Fund really supported me through that journey because they were the Global Education Fund did robust programs outside school for me, um, mentorship and leadership structured programs where in s we would go um, to a university, we would be paired with uh, university students, uh, asked to design uh, projects, pitch them, you know, and we owned the whole process. So there's something about that experience that was really supplementary to my educational journey. Uh, in high school, and then I went to Bryn Mawr School, so that, that then did uh, l another layer of critical thinking and teaching in that sense, but I definitely noticed they were, we were missing that, and um, I think if there is systemic failure, then we can have supplementary programs to, to bridge the gaps uh, that exist, for sure. And I think I just want to pick up on that because, okay, so I'm a mom, I have a three and a half year old. Mm -hmm. And so I am constantly trying to figure out how am I going to, and I am, I refuse to take a step back in my career. Mm -hmm. um, and so how am I going to manage things like after school? And school will end at two in the afternoon and 11 a.m. on Wednesdays. And I look for after school programs. And I look to my community to help me find free and low cost after school programs. And I look to schools that make a very specific, um, a specific and equal designation of resources between sports and arts. 
because both of those things are really necessary. I, you know, my partner made a decision. We're going to have a kid. If we do this, they have to have some kind of art or music and some kind of sport because those build these other skills. They build opportunities and they help us be well-rounded. Um, and so that's, I mean, that's me personally. And so I, I don't live in the U.S., so, but if I did, I would probably go and find my local school board and demand some transparency on budgeting and ask, okay, I want to go to the local sports team events and I will be willing to pay a buck fifty or whatever it costs, you know, a little bit because everything helps. And I also want to go to local plays being put on by, my, by the high school. I want to be able to go to you know, art shows and things like that and give the same investment to those because I think there needs to be some balance. And school boards, local governance, there's, there's opportunities. Uh, obviously, I'm a policy person. <laughs> Thank you. Um, th this question we, I've received from several different people. Um, and the question is, how can we help? Uh, how can we help? What can we do? Um, especially, uh, or um, as adult, non-students, non-educators, what can people do to help? Um, there is so much uh, that, uh, that everybody in this room can do to help. There is so much that can be done to help um, with where students are around the world and help, helping to educate girls, or girls around the world, but also so much uh, that can be done here locally. Um, as Anissa said, the support that that she got as an individual, um, and there are plenty in this community uh, to be able to find and, and, and do your homework, find the local organizations that are working with underserved youth, um, and figure out what they need and show up. Uh, they may need funding, they may need after school tutors, um, but the power, the changing one person's life and the kind of support um, that students often need is transformational. So the first thing I say is, um, it, is it is everybody's responsibility to figure out what drives you, what is interesting to you, and then find an organization that suits those needs because if it's not you're not going to stick with it so there are local options in terms of international options the same there are so many organizations that are uh, that need resources to do the work that they do on the front lines and so and there are lots of ways to raise those resources um, and so again think about what is it that drives you where can you spend your time and your treasure because both are needed um, by a host of organizations around the world who are doing this work. I also want to throw out there um, if you can think of ways that younger people can also help that don't have the resources like money or whatever. For both grown-up adults and children, civic and engagement. Make sure you are engaged in your local communities. Make sure you hold your leaders in, you know, accountable. Make sure that you're uh, present in the conversations. At the local level, at the national level, the international level, the leaders that we, you put in place, again, determine the kind of environment and education systems that, that we have. And so as a student, as an elderly person, civic engagement is very key. Yeah, I also just want to say for young people, I agree voting. <laughs> Make sure that you show up for your local elections, for your state elections, for your national elections, and think about the kind of leaders that you want in those positions. And um, I would, if you look at, in some places, what it costs to send a girl to school for a year, it is not very much. $30 in some places will fund a whole year of books um, and tuition for a girl. So students are often, uh, I know I was a student for a really long time, you don't have very much money, but if you get together with your friends, if you decide, you know what, for, these, for this next month, I'm gonna go w without that, the, the coffee that I buy or whatever, and I'm gonna save this money, or with my friends, I'm gonna get together and raise a little bit of money, you can make a tremendous difference. Your time, as a young person, again, to be able to be a mentor to younger students or show up. Somebody was telling me, uh, my, my student ambassador that I was paired with was telling me how she shows up at a, at a kindergarten and reads and volunteers her time. Uh, there is so much. Do not feel like there are not options for you if you don't have money to spend, um, but you do have your time. And so find something, again, that's meaningful to you and make a commitment and show up because you are you can make a tremendous difference in the life of somebody else. 
Um, okay. Sorry. So many of that same question. Oh, here's another one. Um, uh, with that, we have got at least two of them about how can we um, get uh, males to understand that women empowerment, rape, and sexual assault is not a joke or to be joked about. <laughs> okay, so this is a great question, and uh, because it is so important, and boys talk to boys, dudes talk to your friends. You see it, say something. You know, and uh, there's an ad campaign, an anti-terrorism ad campaign in New York City subways that says, if you see something, say something. That goes for jokes around, you don't joke about taking away somebody's agency. You don't joke about violence. It's not funny. So say something. And honestly, this is where um, it's not, I, I, don't think, I don't think it's women's job to teach men not to be rapists. Come on. Boys, handle yourselves. <laughs> no, I, I, I mean, serious. Come on. And look, I, I'm, I'm a mom of a son, so it's my job as a mom to teach my son to be a good human to respect and to respect women. Absolutely. But boys, be responsible to each other um, because you guys do great things. You're fun. We I like boys. Boys are fun. Don't don't be jerks. Uh, you know, it, it's not hard. Yeah. It's really not that hard, um, and it's a choice, and everybody can make that choice. So that's I just want I want to reinforce that that is something boys can really do with each other that makes the world so much better for everyone. The socialization process very very key. We need to, and I want to applaud all the young men in this. Yay. Thank you. That's the way to go. <laughs> I want to applaud the parents, the teachers, whoever brought these young men, and I want to say I see you and I so respect you and I appreciate you for being here. So we start young with them. Start young with them. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so... Uh, Here's another student question. Uh, what advice do you have for girls who are struggling to find their voices and who want to speak out against inequality? So what I do here is I keep taking the microphone. <laughs> um, and I'm terribly, I'm a really shy person. It, it, it takes a lot of work. I, I amp myself up. I talked to somebody yesterday. She apparently has a playlist. She's going to share it on Spotify to get amped up to talk to people because, you know, you need to, you need to do it. But do it because it, it, it's kind of cool. And, um, and, you know, for women get overlooked a lot. Um, and I've seen this, I've seen it in my own life, uh, where, you know, you go kind of, you see, and if you saw the movie on the basis of sex, right, about RBG, uh, then, then you saw this scene where she's at Harvard and, you know, and she's, and her hand is up. She wants to talk to the class and, and she wants to answer a question and the professor's just like, hmm. <laughs> and that, hap that still happens. Okay, so, and so we've got to stand up and we've got to be bold and be loud. And we've got to also remember that it's not always, we don't have to do it all the time. Um, it's okay to also find other ways to be, to be bold that may not be out front. I would also say uh, when I first started um, having to do public speaking, um, I, I had done a lot of theater when I was younger. And uh, it was terrifying to think about actually being myself instead of playing a character <laughs> and speaking out. And so sometimes I, I, I say to people, like, pretend you're to practice. First of all, it just takes practice. It takes practice. It takes doing it. It takes doing it sometimes where you're good, and then you do it sometimes and you're bad, and you realize, you know what? You're still okay. Like, nothing calamitous has happened because you weren't the most articulate on that particular day. You're still okay. You're still valuable, and you still have something useful to say. That happens to everybody. So if you need to practice, and you're really trying to summon up your courage, you can listen to the playlist, or and you can also just pretend, like put on a suit of armor. You can say like, I'm gonna pretend that I'm the person who's really comfortable standing up, raising my hand and saying something, and I'm gonna pretend I'm that person. And you practice enough, and you know what? You get used to it. And, um, and again, you're, it, don't be afraid that, it, that you're not going to say something perfectly. Don't be afraid that you're not going to um, be the most articulate uh, because you have something valuable to say and trust yourself. Indeed, indeed. Yeah. <laughs>
Um, and I think we, we have three minutes left, so we have this one qu quick question. Can you share one book that has made an impact on your life? I will share an author. Uh, because I can't ever remember the name of her book. Uh, and she writes a lot of articles. It's Frida Berrigan. Uh, and she's, right now, she's one of the people I go to for inspiration because she comes out of a, a fierce feminist tradition, a fierce anti-nuclear tradition, and she talks about the struggles of raising feminist boys. So that's something I'm, you know, I'm very into what Frida is writing. I'm also gonna share an author, Maya Angelou. Uh, I love Maya, and because she speaks from a place of vulnerability and, and does not sugarcoat anything. So as a woman, I think I find her very strong. Um, I recommend her so much. I recommend her um, to all of you. <laughs> I'll share a book, uh, Dead Aid. Uh, it was, I really enjoyed reading that book. Uh, um, it talks about alternatives to aid, and I, do be I honestly believe that um, commerce and production and education uh, is the way to go instead of free handouts. So I really like that book. Dead, Dead Aid. Dead Aid? Yes. D-E-A-D. Aid. Gosh, that's such a hard question. Mm -hmm. uh, there are so many amazing books out there. Um, a book that I uh, read a couple of years ago um, R written by David Brooks, who's a New York Times um, writer. It was called On the Road to Character. And um, I uh, am a mom. I've got three kids. Uh, I think a lot about uh, how, how I'm raising them. Um, the work that I do is about social justice and, uh, and, and identifying things in the world that need to change. And I found that book incredibly thought-provoking about um, how we... There's this fine line, I think, between uh, the messages about standing up for your individual rights and, you know, you do you and all of this, like, very focused on um, people's individual path and success and what you want to do. Uh, because I believe it's important for us to be able to develop as human beings and stand up and kind of own our power. At the same time, he makes a really interesting argument about what our um, responsibility is to the collective. What is our responsibility to society, to social, um, to, to social work, to social justice? So um, I have found that book and also some of his really recent writings about um, local change makers and individuals who are bringing communities together um, really inspiring um, for the work that I'm doing and as I again think about being a parent and uh, and how I also show up in the world. Thanks so much. It is 1140 so that's it.